And my question is uh, regarding digital currency, we've seen uh, recently in the last few days that China has proposed creating their own digital currency. And I was wondering how much of a threat is that to the dollar, uh, to, to the dollar and its dominance of uh, world markets? And if it is a threat, what can we do about it? Well, um, you know, I think I think there's sort of a lot of different kinds of things that fall under digital currency. Presumably, the one the sort of electronic forms of money China envisions are ones where um, things can be monitored again, even more uh, granular in an even more granular way. Uh, than they're being monitored currently. Um, uh, you know, the the geopolitical thing I, I sort of wonder about is always that, uh, you know, the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency of, of the world. You know, there are some things about that that are good for the U.S., some things that are um, more problematic. Um, from China's point of view, they want to get, um, they don't like the U.S. having this reserve currency because it gives us, you know, a lot of leverage over, you know, Iranian oil supply chains and all sorts of things like that. Um, they like uh, they don't want the renminbi to become a reserve currency because then you have to open your capital account and you have to do all sorts of things that they they really don't want to do. Um, you know, I think the euro you could think of as you know was in part a Chinese weapon against the dollar. It didn't in the last decade it hasn't quite worked out that way, but that was you know China would have liked to see two reserve currencies like like the euro. And uh, you know even though I'm sort of a pro-crypto, pro-Bitcoin maximalist person. I, I do wonder whether at this point Bitcoin is also, uh, should also be thought in part of, as a Chinese uh, financial weapon against the U.S. where it's, it, is, it threatens fiat money, but it especially threatens the, uh, the U.S. Uh, dollar and, um, and China wants to do things to weaken it. So it's sort of China is long Bitcoin and perhaps from a geopolitical perspective uh, the U.S. should be a little bit, uh, be asking some tougher questions about Exactly how that works, but I, I, some some internal stable coin in China, that I mean that's not that's not a real cryptocurrency. That's just a, you know that's just some sort of totalitarian measuring device. Venmo uh, for the communist. Yes, Mr. Secretary, are you going to comment on that? That that story made the front page of the <coughs> journal this morning, or Mr. Ambassador, about China wanting to start their own Bitcoin. What do you think about that? So what, if I understand what they're doing is they're digitizing their currency. So separate from. Bitcoin is still a fiat currency, right? That is still mm -hmm. Chinese money that they are now digitizing. It has huge impacts for their surveillance capacity. They would pitch it as anti-fraud. You can prevent fraud from taking place. Uh, I suppose that's true. Uh, this is something I think they believe will reduce the costs of cross-border transactions as well for the Chinese. Your point about not wanting to be a reserve currency I think is right. Uh, I think they'd like it to be among a mix. They want to make sure that when uh, when Secretary Pompeo issues the sanctions against the Iranian leadership, that there is a way to purchase Iranian oil that we don't have the capacity to either seize, understand, or uh, impact. And so I do think these digital currencies, separate from uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, are something you'll see more countries go to. The United States has a project where we're working on it too, but we are we we will be we will be slow off the gate. It has lots of implications for us here at home. And uh, my guess is that we will not be the leader in this forefront where an authoritarian regime like China sees nearly all upside from having the capacity to issue currency or take away currency from people who act in ways that are inconsistent with uh, Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping thought. No, a a absolutely. You think of one of the things that gives folks freedom is the ability to walk in with a $100 bill or, or, or some type of currency and buy something without it being tracked. But the Chinese will be able to track every single purchase that everyone makes. Now, we've freely given up that uh, that privacy in many ways with Amazon, so there's a record of everything that we purchase these days, it seems like, uh, especially during COVID. Uh, but, but by taking away, uh, you know, hard currency that can uh, that can be used to purchase things, uh, it, it, it will give the Chinese Communist Party an, an enormous measure of control over the, the Chinese people, which and, and every, every time they have an opportunity for more control, they'll take it. And, and as Peter pointed out and the Secretary pointed out, uh, uh, this is another big step along with facial recognition to have a a total surveillance yeah, I mean, society. They'll know every single, single thing that you I mean, on, on some level, it is, it, is, it is really an extraordinary sociological political experiment with, with no real 20th century precedent. I mean, you know, there, there are ways that, you know, probably, you know, <laughs> Stalin was still worse than G and right. probably killed more people. But, uh, but just the degree of hooks that you have into people is, is just extraordinary. It's sort of like, you know, it's like sort of the government's, you know, in your innermost core, and it's completely out. It's like the, 
God of St. Augustine. It's like <laughs> totally outside you, totally inside you, yeah. knows everything about you. It's, uh, but oh, can you not, imagine not, how, how this will factor into the social credit score? Omnipotent, yeah. omniscient, yeah. 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 omnimalevolent. Yeah. No, and, uh, Makes uh, the Stasi look like amateurs. No, and the social, <laughs> the social credit score, when you, when you tie in the currency uh, to everything yeah, what you're, else. What you're spending money be, on yeah, and everything, be, yeah. You know, uh, I, quite something I, to hold. I, 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 I've never heard the term omnimalevolent before. <laughs> No, Peter, following up on Mike's uh, question, which I, I think there's a consensus now that AI and quantum computing are the new high grounds, or at least mm -hmm. will be the high grounds for the future. And, and, I, and I think there's still a consensus that we have an edge uh, in both those areas, yes. although, again, it's, uh, it's a diminished edge over where it was uh, a few years back. Uh, what's your advice to the Biden administration? How do we stay ahead on quantum and AI, uh, you know, keeping in mind that we're an open society and we've got all these graduate students here and that sort of thing? Uh, what, what do we need to do to... Uh, to stay in the forefront, because my, my concern is if we fall behind, we lose the high ground, uh, we're going to be in for a rough spell. Yeah, the thing that I would say is tricky about AI is that there are you know a lot of aspects of the technology that I think we don't actually want to be pursuing too much because um, it's it's AI is what you need for a surveillance society. Right. You know, I've, I've I've had this riff where you know people often say crypto or Bitcoin is a vaguely libertarian technology. I mean, technology is politically neutral, but it can still be. <laughs> crypto is sort of, right. if crypto is kind of libertarian, then AI is kind of communist. And uh, and so even though we're ahead from the you know basic science of AI, China is willing to apply it. It's willing to turn the entire society into, you know, a face recognition surveillance state that's, uh, you know, far more intrusive, far more totalitarian than even, you know, Stalinist Russia was. I, I thought I'd get one that, that comes to technology. It's a narrower question mm -hmm. than where I began. So uh, our team spent a lot of time thinking about semiconductors and the ecosystem around mm -hmm. it and the manufacture of semiconductors. I went back this week, you'd, you'd sent a note out, and I went back and uh, reread then uh, Nixon-Kennedy debates where they were debating these two little islands off the coast of China that are part of Taiwan formally in deep, intricate debates. Taiwan is even more central today mm -hmm. to the uh, high-tech infrastructure for the world, TSMC itself. Yes and all of, the, uh, all, all of the subsidiary technologies around yes. it. I wonder what your sense is. So we have a policy. It's our uh, one China policy and the communiques that flow from it. The Trump administration largely stayed with that. G give me your sense of what would happen if that were abandoned, not necessarily through military force, like, right, we didn't steal it, if it's coerced into those semiconductors not being available for, and that the hand semiconductors not being as readily available to the West. What's your sense and how should we, how should the private sector think about that as well? Well, um, you know, I, th I think they're basically two um, cutting-edge semiconductor manufacturers. It's uh, Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung. And uh, there were probably something like 30 semiconductor companies that were cutting-edge uh, 20 years ago right. uh, or 30 years ago. And so it's, uh, it's gotten a lot more expensive, so these scale economies. And, um, and, um, and so... And then you have these questions about, you know, how many semiconductors do you need that are really cutting edge versus how many can be these, you know, um, more cheap mass-produced uh, things. But, uh, but yeah, probably, um, yeah, probably, you know, if, if you need a, if you're going to have a self-driving car, that probably will require a, uh, a cutting edge semiconductor. And uh, that's where, you know, th th there's probably some weird way in which, from an economic point of view, um, you can almost think of Taiwan as just, it's just this one company. It's, um, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor. And then you know the the political questions are you know who really controls the company, is it, you know is is it does the Chinese Communist Party have hooks into it, um, or you know are they still more scared of them? But uh, but somehow the the board corporate politics of Taiwan Semiconductor are probably, in some ways, a proxy for all of Taiwan. <laughs> On one other area of the whole tech tech stacks, we're covering a lot of ground here. Um, we're um, uh, Mike, maybe I'll ask you we're we're and how do you think about the space race that sort of emerging, you know, with, you know, some extent Russia, but even more with, with China and um, where, you know, they're sort of launching all these killer satellites and yeah. maybe space weapons or, you know, and a lot of this, of course, is, you know, very classified. Yeah, a lot but of it's classified. And, and there's a lot of people that know more about it than I do. But suffice it to say, here, here's a data point that's useful. In 2019, the Chinese t launched more missiles than the rest of the world combined. Mm -hmm. Those are tests, right? They just have the resources, the scale of what they're doing to work to put up the right satellites, to work to make sure they've got the capability uh, is staggering, and they are moving very, very quickly. And so I don't want to say much about where we are from a parity perspective, but there will be uh, an enormous amount of energy and resources put into place 
so that whenever there's a conflagration somewhere in the world, mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a global one, uh, that space will be able to generate an awful lot of leverage and an awful lot of power for some country who gets this most right.